everyone. I'm Lady Genevieve, and I am so happy that I am here with Peter Shinkola. Thank you so much for talking with me today. Um, I don't know what if this is going to be take one or take two. We've already been chatting, but just some technical malfunctions. But we're here now. It's good. It's cute. So uh, you're here promoting Salvage Marines. Oh, yeah. And uh, I wanted to ask you whether or not this character was originally Asian or if it was just an open-ended casting of like any ethnicity could audition. I can say proudly, confidently, I got to play a Japanese written character. He was exactly uh, the way I portrayed him, was uh, pretty much exactly the way he was written out in the, uh, the, the novels by Sean Michael Argo, uh, Necrospace. So yeah, Ben Takeda was a uh, 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 Japanese heritage, that was his name, and uh, luckily for me, I have a great friend in Casper Van Dien, and uh, he brought up that uh, that character was being considered to be whitewashed, and he didn't want it as a producer on the show, and he insisted that uh, they consider me, so he gave me a call, and um, looked at the material, and I said, absolutely, this kind of role does not come along often, I'm, uh, all, I'm all over it, so uh, I was happy. Doesn't, you know, a lot of times these roles just go away. You will never even know. Mm. But I think that Casper once having, a, well, I think you mentioned you're a Starship Troopers fan. Wasn't <laughs> his name Johnny Rico? Wasn't he Juan in, in, in Argentina or something in the Starship Troopers book? Well, I mean, the changes to that book are so mad. It's beyond just that. It's like, originally the book endorses fascism, but Paul right. Verhoeven is like a mad genius. And yes, he's like, he actually, we're going to satirize militant American jingoism. Right. And that's why everybody's speaking American English like they were from Torrance and they're in Buenos Aires. <laughs> Do you notice that? So, yeah. I noticed that right off the bat when I watched it. Nonetheless, I enjoyed it because I didn't know the, the original material, but... Um, after that, I think uh, Casper actually took flack for that, and he, he uh, being the decent guy that he is, he said, I, I won't let that happen. And um, I was friends with him for maybe, uh, but for years previous to, to me um, coming on board this project. So when he came to me, it was flattering and it was refreshing. And uh, from Casper, typical, he's such, such a nice guy. So that's how it came to me, and um, he wanted to be authentic. I appreciated that, I respected that, and uh, you know, I was on board. Mm. Yeah. So I've seen the first two episodes of mm. the show, okay. and not very much has been revealed about your character yet, sure. so what insight can you offer? Uh, you don't have to spoil anything major, but just in a general sense of like the essence of who this character is. Um, well, I think in the first two it's, it's revealed, you've seen them, uh, that my character's you could say is reluctant to, to go off onto these uh, this space adventure, um, and he's certainly a different uh, a different character than he is by the end of the sixth episode, the first season arc. Um, I'll leave that for you guys in your imagination. But what usually happens when you know a reluctant soldier gets drafted, and then by the end of the season, what happens? Either I'm going to be you know crying in a in a in, in a trench somewhere, or I'll become the soldier that I have to be. So um, check it out. It's, 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 you know, over the six episodes, there's uh, a lot of twists and turns. And, um, you know, there's definitely a direction for mm -hmm. this character. And hopefully, you know, beyond that, too. The, I, six episodes to me was just enough to whet my appetite. It was really fun to, 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 to embrace a character like this one for me. On a personal level, personal, professional level, I never really got to play with a character that had this kind of arc. So um, I took it and I ran with it. And there's so much more to investigate. Six episodes is just uh, you know, whetting your appetite. You can go so much further and investigate so much more in all the characters, not, not necessarily only mine. Mm, so it's six episodes? At this point, season? it's six episodes. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. Because like, they did not tell me any. Like I haven't seen a trailer. It's just eventually they got me the screeners. And I was like... 60 episodes. <laughs> No, but I mean, like, because I was trying to gauge what is the arc of this story and that, like, trying to envision that would be very different depending on how many episodes you have, so. Sorry. No, it's cool. You're at Comic-Con. You're popular, presumably. People want to Actually, it was a uh, castmate, Kevin Porter. <laughs> I guess he's in town and wants to eat. He's a big guy. He's always hanging. Mm, he's, yeah. Uh, yeah, he plays uh, uh, Boss Marsters. He's the big guy in the, uh, on, on the poster. 
uh, Kevin Porter. He does a great job too. What a talent. Another thing that I wanted mm -hmm. to ask you, since there is a certain amount of action in the show, sure. was there anything that was unique about the training process for this, or was it pretty similar to the training that you would have had for other acting jobs? I, I've, I've played military before, so I'm familiar with a lot of the, the, the weapons and the, the protocol, being around weapons. And so, listen, there's a lot of focus on that now. The handling of, uh, you know, props and weaponry and then and, and, and live explosives and rounds on set as we know but having said that I've been around a lot of it this one we did have um, you know pretty intense um, week week and a half of training what made this one different was it was in the humidity of Louisiana in the dead of summer so that made it excruciatingly un dis uh, you know, uh, uncomfortable that was uh, the the that was the only difference you know, I've been through this training and I thought it was pretty easy, but we were running a lot of these courses and exercises outside of the um, the, the studio, um, outside of Baton Rouge in the middle of the summer. So, uh, you know, there was an added degree of difficulty there. It was the humidity and the heat, but the, most of the stuff was familiar. And, and, and aside from rehearsals, the actual shooting days, um, there was one episode where we had to go to these uh, this, this real life occurring sand dunes in um, Louisiana. They in fact, shot that Tom Cruise movie, Oblivion, there. So it looks like, uh, you know, Serengeti. And uh, we shot maybe a week and a half there, a massive, big, epic battle scene. Oh, oh, excuse me, on a, on a supposed desert planet. That was difficult. People were fainting, and um, I myself had to hold it together a few times. Like, Pete, you know, I'm fine, I'm fine. I'm so not fine. <laughs> it, was, it was one of those situations. So it gets... Uh, uncomfortable but it's a it's a fun uncomfortable you know you're getting into this um getting into the show you know exactly what's uh, you know what's in store we're, we're literally playing cowboys and indians you know uh on uh, while the camera rolls so i knew it was going to be difficult and get a bunch of bumps and bruises but um 200 percent fun mm -hmm. all the time all the time so for those who are unfamiliar with the premise of the show it's basically mm -hmm. uh people join this squad, I guess you could call it, uh, because they're in debt and that's basically their only way of earning money to pay off this obscene debt to mega corporations. So naturally, I observe a premise like that and I immediately think of the military industrial complex. So uh, beyond just the obvious of like, I'm not going to ask you if that's like really, like, it's so obviously you know, intertwined, but sure. I wanted to ask your opinion on a more philosophical level of, do you think that art that has that type of socio-political commentary, do you think it can change things? Or do you think that it just kind of keeps us passive where we have the catharsis by watching the thing, but then we don't actually go out and do anything? Both. Surely we're making this to entertain people, so there's that factor and hopefully it does. The other part is maybe you're having it's a social commentary, and, and people could take it to heart and uh, make you know small <coughs> incremental changes in their life, and we can change all of society. But clearly, this was a this was a, a, a take by Sean Michael Argo and a cynical one on, on what he sees as a possible future. Um, I think, present. And present. <coughs> it's present. Yeah. Clearly, corporations have a lot of uh, power. Some would even say they have politicians in their pocket. But this is exactly what the story is about. And, uh, you know, in, in, uh, in, a, in, a, in a distant future, everything, the whole universe is run by corporations. And uh, the only the military is the military that, uh, you know, that, that, that who, who, uh, whose payrolls, you know, those checks are paid by the, these corporations. And in this particular case, it's two that are run. And our story is uh, one corporation is Hellion, and, and the other one's the Grotto Corporation, which uh, uh, the leads in our show belong to. But they're always at odds with each other for, for over, you know, uh, capitalistic, uh, you know, desires. So it's not that far off. It's almost a, a warning about what we are becoming. So I thought that was extremely clever. Um, and he built a real world around it over his uh, several novels, Sean Michael Argo. And uh, that was one of the most attractive parts. After uh, realizing what he was saying, I'm like, oh, I'm all over this. I'd like to have a message. 
uh, with, all, with all the work. I just don't have that kind of um, opportunity, choice, or some would say the privilege of have, having different projects that you can pick and choose. But this one came along and it, it, it aligned with my politics and certainly my fears about the you know, uh, impending future. Well, I mean, the House just voted to increase the annual military bill to over $800 billion a year. So, like... Increased it again, huh? Yeah, so, Canada's, like, I'm watching the show and I'm just like... Canada might invade. We don't know. <laughs> can't, can't, be, can't be too sure. Too no, ready. I mean, <laughs> the the imperialists in charge of both of those countries are best friends with each other. Like, I oh. have no doubt about that. But, you know... Canada, the 51st state. <laughs> I'm Canadian. I can say anything I want about Canada. Yeah, of course you can. Well, yeah. see, I have the, the unique privilege of talking trash about the U.S. government and the Japanese government, but we don't need to get into all of the specifics That's of that. That's why this is like... a great complimentary <laughs> sit-down. We can say it all between the two of us. Yeah, I won't, I won't get into specifics because I'm not yeah. going to drag you into my opinions, but just know that I have them because I do. And we're so. free to express them <laughs> in this free world. Uh, just on a more like geeky trivia level, yeah. did you work on Romeo Must Die? What is this bit of trivia I see floating around the internet? Because that is a cinematic masterpiece. <laughs> I will not hear a single bad word about Romeo Must Die. It's a okay. banger. No, 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 no. Okay. No, 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 no. Jet Li and Alia in the club. Like, I know. It's a vibe. It's a vibe. It's, yeah. They did it for the culture. It was everything. I was there through it all. Yeah. I was there because I was working at Warner Brothers as um, an editor in post-production uh, in the last few years of uh, the millennium. And I remember when I came across that script, I had access to all the shows that Warner was doing. I read it and I heard that they were going to green light it. And um, somewhere it came to me that they were d d choosing Vancouver as a location, being Canadian. I was like, mm, and an aspiring Hector. I was like, ooh. And I found out uh, it was going to be Chinese versus Italians, and Italians versus black, and then Chinese versus Japanese. It, it changed so much. Oh. This is how fickle it is behind the scenes. Yeah. In a week, it was, who were we going to get? And then they decided on Chinese versus Japanese. Uh, that's how that ended up happening. Uh, and then I found out I was shooting in Vancouver. Being Canadian, I said, I've never been to Vancouver. I'm going to ask, uh, you know, Joel Silver and Jim Van Wick, they were producers over there. And, those big guys, if I could be, uh, you know, an editing hire locally up there, we're not going to fly you up there on a Warner Brothers time. You're Canadian. If you find your way up there, we'll hire as a local hire. We'll get you a leave of absence here. So I got a leave of absence from the, uh, the studio because I was a in-studio uh, 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 post-production employee, assistant editor. So I went up there for a few months and um, got an agent in Vancouver and I started to book. I booked like the first three out of four auditions I got while I was editing. So I was literally shooting up in Vancouver while I was working for Warner Brothers and then taking time off and they had to find permittees to replace me as I was shooting things in Vancouver but supposed to be editing up there for Warner Brothers. Mm. So I went back after principal photography and I gave my, uh, my, my couple weeks and then I, I left <laughs> editing and I moved up to Vancouver. Mm. And I've been floating uh, between there and, and, and LA again since then. Mm -hmm. yeah. Although the last two years I spent in Canada, pandemic. Yeah. Pandemic made, made me stay up there. Yeah. Had but that's to. cool that you have some sort of like intertwinedness, that's not a word, but you know. Of, yeah. Uh, and the funny thing was like, I, I had known Russell Wong and we were talking and hanging out on the set and I was there with the big fire scene when, you know, they're fighting in fire and Jet Li's all burnt up and his hands are all melted. And then Aaliyah's mom was always on set, which was, she was so sweet, and Aaliyah was sweet. And I uh, can't believe, it was only a year later she died. Um, yeah, so I got to meet her a bunch of times. She was so nice. can't believe how nice she was, just a class act. Russell was nice, Jet Li was great. And the thing is, I had just worked with him on, on Lethal Weapon 4. Nobody knew who he was. Lethal Jet Li? Jet, or? Nobody oh. knew who Jet, no American knew, unless you were Asian, knew who Jet Li was in 1996. <sighs> nobody. Like I went around and said, whoa, is, are we looking at Jet Li to be the star of Lethal Weapon 4 against, against Martin Riggs and Martin, this could be awesome. Who's Jet Li, Pete? And then Lethal 4 came out, he's made a household American star and that's when Romeo Must Die, Exit Wounds and you know, Cradle to the Grave came out and then he kind of went back to China. But uh, 
that's what made Jet Li was those you know two three movies that he did for Silver Pictures at the time mm. that made him a household name here. And uh, I was there, the infamous non kiss at the end. Yeah. <laughs> That was one of the last left, days of shooting it. Yeah, yeah. I, I left a very angry comment on Letterboxd where I was like, they should have kissed. It was the most bizarre thing. And I felt awkward while they are shooting because I knew exactly what was going to be the commentary on it. Whatever they chose. It's a lose-lose situation. Mm. You see, Aaliyah kissed him at the end. People are going to go apeshit and troll that stuff. Mind you, there was no trolling because there was no internet then. But, uh, you know, people would have said things. And Were they, they not thinking about uh, Whitney Houston's Cinderella? Yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> I almost got that part, too. That was years before. That guy Montalban got it. Yeah, like yeah, he's Filipino. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's icon. He looks exactly the same today, by the way. For he anyone must who, great. For anyone who's wondering, he looks exactly he's the same. Musical. He's a musical. He's a musical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Guy, right? he, I remember he did Mortal Kombat Conquest, which was between me him and William Lee back in 1998 and he got it and then he went on to the Cinderella I wonder where he is he's, he's a fine actor I think he still like does theater does he? yeah well I mean he, with a voice like that why yeah. wouldn't you? yeah exactly he's probably <laughs> ruling the stage <laughs> in the, yeah. you know in the, on, on, on Broadway parts yeah. that's, that's great good for him good for him yeah. so I'm curious about with you playing this character on this new show yeah was there anything that you feel like you brought to the character that was not on the page? Like something that you, as an actor, like, I don't know, you make a choice or you bring something out that isn't necessarily there. Because I've been starting to study a little bit more about different pieces of film production. And, you know, when you actually look at screenplays, they're kind of like bare bones. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of room for actors to kind of fill things in and flesh things out more. Sure. Uh, well... Parts aren't written like this for Asian guys in Hollywood. Usually they're, like I've seen the part I play here, the, the, uh, the archetype is out there in movies. There's a lead guy and then there's always the, the, the buddy. Um, and I understood that. It's there to support uh, you know, the, 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 the main storyline, but um, you gotta have a, you know, a, a creative relationship and tension and drama with all the events that happened uh, to us. That said, I want to bring a lot of who I am. I think in my personal, on a personal level, what I bring to my friendships and what people um, gravitate towards me for is never revealed on screen. I think that's, you know, mostly uh, your own voice or your own personality. I'm really bound by uh, a lot of strict parameters that are written for me when I've written into these shows controlled by very non-diverse creatives. Mm. So this was the first time that I not only had um, the green light from the producers on set, because I was, I was friends with a lot of the creatives on this, including Casper, so uh, I could actually be heard. And my demands and my thoughts can be heard and listened to it at, at the least. So I had carte blanche to do anything I wanted. and. Pretty much did. I didn't want to go overboard, but I certainly want to bring personality that was unique to me, and I kind of wanted to rid it and not bring even a touch of Asianism in. You know, when parts are, I'm in this, but I'm playing a part that's specifically Asian, and it's, it's crucial to the storyline. And this, I had none. I'm just a guy. It could have been the guy named, you know, the, uh, could have been the, another Chris, just the Chris guy, you know, and. Um, I, I, I think I took the opportunity to just, just be, as opposed to how do they need me to show my Asian-ness? It was just completely gone. I'm have just, your face be visible. Right, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm Asian, but just letting my face be visible. Yeah. That's it. Everything else is, every, it just plays. That's the whole thing. They, I don't know if people think that we're capable of just being like a Brad or a Chad or Sean or Chris. We're just like that, you know, so... I was, um, and to tell you the truth, it's unique and it's almost strange to me because I'm always bringing an Asian angle. And this, I had to let it all go. Just, just be a person, you know. Mm. So I was just trying to be comfortable in that zone and, and, and be freed up. And uh, hopefully, it, people will get to see a side of me that uh, hasn't been seen, you know. Yeah. I think my character comes more. You've seen the first two. It certainly changes over the next, uh, you know, the later episodes for mm. sure. Yeah, well, I mean, hopefully, as more people succeed in different areas, then I think once 
the numbers are higher, just how many people are in the industry and mm -hmm. working, then I think you'll start to see it kind of be a little less rigid in how people get portrayed. Because even if it's people really act like it's a binary of like you're either Asian, like born and raised in the motherland or you're diaspora. And it's like there's a whole spectrum. Like I don't really exactly I don't, I don't really relate to a lot of like Asian diaspora because I feel like a lot of them are very determined to be accepted by whatever their diaspora country is and for me it's like i don't care about that at me all neither. like i'm japanese i always say that i'm japanese and i like i don't even like that not i don't i don't dislike the term just for anyone to use but i personally don't identify with like asian american because to me america is just stolen land from indigenous people so like that's it but is. that's me so. yeah it, it's weird because there's 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 certainly a very majority group of asian american celebrities or personalities that are kind of that flow together i'm definitely I don't know, I kind of been iced out of that. I'm just me, I just do my own thing. I'm also unique and as a Canadian, lots of times I get excluded because from things, I'm not Asian American, I'm actually Asian Canadian, like there's a difference. Um, but I find that um, I'm an outsider in that sense as well. Mm. I mean, people have told me, right, when I arrived in Hollywood in the 90s, a lot of these ABCs, the American born Chinese, go, what, 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 you're so hard to place, you got like this grunge hair, man. And, you listen to the cult and Guns N' Roses, you're like some Canadian rocker. Yeah, Shinkoda. This is what they used to say. And I'm like, okay. And you all listen to Keith Sweat and Boys to Men. It, I, but I'm not remarking on it. I mean, when I say all of you, all 30 of you in my acting class all listen to R&B. Mm -hmm. But you're looking at me like I'm some anomaly weirdo with long hair. It's like, we're all unique and different. But do you want me to be part of this, you know, very... It's very clicky. I don't get of, it. Like, I don't like clicky with clicky in any race. Mm. You know, that's just another version of kind of a racism. You know, to be clicky is kind of like it's exclusionary. I mean, my friends are from all like, over the place. Like, exactly. Like man. every day, it's like I'm messaging my friend in Scotland, Ireland, right? Sweden. You I, know, all over the place. And I honestly believe that's that's the, the the only solution to to any kind of racism, just ongoing for centuries. It's just people fear. People fear. If you wouldn't fear. You would stand up for all your friends if you just had a diverse group of friends. If you isolate yourself, you're not rich with understanding. Yeah. You're, love, you're, you're, you're very, uh, you know, of a, a myopic view of things. Um, in the end, the sociologists, the specialists say, make friends, interact with people that don't look like yourself or don't come from the same walk of life. I think that's the ultimate solution. Seems like you're practicing it, so yeah. I try well, to just hang out with people so different from me and be non-judgmental. That's really it, and listen. That's what I try to do. Well, it's easy, like, I'm an anti-imperialist, so it's very easy for me to make friends with, like, Scottish people and Irish people, because, like... Are you part Scottish? No, uh -huh. but, like, they're being occupied. So, you know, the, there's stuff we talk about where it's like, <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. It's like, yeah, no, I feel you, comrade. Like, I understand, like... I need to more understand more about that place. I'm like, there's a lot of strife <laughs> on that little island. A lot of pushing around for centuries well like, wow. scotland is gearing up to do another independence referendum and i think I it's gonna like pass that. and i'm very much rooting for them for that it's gonna be fun so it's all up in the air everybody's in on this party now see uk is what well Boris parliament is in her. shambles and it's i mean i shouldn't laugh because like there's a trickle down to how who that impacts but you sure know. sure it does everybody's impacting everywhere i swear the governments now are like the crazy weather around the world everything's just spinning out of control everywhere you know i guess uh, it's somewhat gratifying to me it's like everybody feels that like everybody in equal parts so it's kind of that's equality <laughs> you know but it's clearly the world's in turmoil right now i can't turn can't bear to turn on the news this is why this sd this SDCC is just refreshing. Yeah. And uh, could it be times better? Mm -hmm. You know? I'm like, this is a good little break from the news outlets. The world. But this news outlet is good, ladies <laughs> and gentlemen. This is fun. But uh, the, the other real, real stuff. <laughs> Chilling. Yeah. yeah. Because of the fact that I don't know if it actually recorded, and I want to make sure that I do have something of me addressing it on camera, I do want to reiterate to you, even though I've already told you this, that I'm very happy for this opportunity to talk to you and to be able to 
you know, use my little platform to help promote something that you're in because of the fact that you were willing to put your neck on the line and speak the truth when it wasn't easy to do that. Because history, like I said before, um, history will always look back on what you did and be like, he was right to do that. Um, a lot of, I think, the the show business or whatever whatever business, when people speak out, they're very like, no, it's bad because you're like you're making problems and whatever. But it's like just wait a little bit longer, yeah. and then eventually people are gonna be like, oh yeah, no, you were right. They go listen to me now, believe me later. Yeah. I mean, when a lot of people, what I'm trying to do is uh, really inspire people to do the same and never let anything get by. If we all call out everything at once, it'll stop them all at once. You know, um, I had people come back and, how do you say that? Do you know how much things I had puke-inducing issues all for the last 30 years, Pete? And you didn't step up to one of those puke-inducing <laughs> moments? I would have been up, and, and instead of puking, I would have challenged this person every single one of those times in 30 years shame on you that's what i want to say to some of these contemporary friends that wrote this on my wall i'm like and you're the big tough kung fu guy so you take you took that abuse for 30 years no me and you are clearly different yeah because um i can't i i haven't all my life i had it well, maybe i like the punishment but the one thing i know is the only way to 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 overcome these certain obstacles that you know, we face us as people of colors. Call people out, <laughs> make them stop. Make it so uncomfortable for them that we don't feel uncomfortable anymore. And that's it. It's that simple, a solution. But yeah. People want to keep, everybody thinks everybody else's comfort is more important just to, to, to somehow uh, to, to keep your situation intact. And that's a, kind of a selfishness, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I'm like, man, if we all help each other, we'll all, you know, when the tide rises, all boats or something like that. I don't yeah. Know, when the tide comes, all boats rise. Well, there's a there's a Chilean revolutionary song called El Pueblo Unido Jamás Será Vencido, and it was big. I think. What was that thirty years old? When did that come out? During Pinochet's rule or something? Oh, you know. P oh, you know your history. You know your. Ch oh, know, you know, know about some all that. Things. Oh, so let but me tell you. But after. wait, but then I can tell you something that like, cause I I have this like little bit of this tidbit that like I can't tell anyone because nobody knows what I'm talking about. Salvador Allende's grandson follows me on Twitter and I have no idea why. Like I followed him first because I was like, I want to know what's going on down there. So I followed him. I've never talked to this man. He's a doctor. He's not a politician. So well, he tells the truth. You know, he doesn't do that like political speak. Until he becomes a politician. But as a no, doctor. I, no, you know, he never will. No, yeah. I don't. I, no. I can tell he's too like unfiltered like he would never cut it really? in politics yeah i don't think so not in chile maybe i don't know if he would want to run somewhere else but yeah so that's about, i can't um, believe you name dropped pinochet there was a lot of, i remember a lot of protests against him in the 80s people uh, mm. lighting themselves on fire oh, at wow. protests. He was, he was a big tyrant in the 80s that's oh, all yeah I as i remember reading the front page of the newspapers i delivered i'd always see him that's why I wow. remember because he was big news back then um isn't it kind of peaceful now Chile and nice and kind of functioning no no, no. they were like protesting non-stop for the what last few it? years well okay what so uh, we don't I can answer this question yeah. but like I'm assuming your people don't want me to like go on a whole tangent about Chilean politics but um, another time that'll yeah. be uh, like <laughs> a, another episode basically mm -hmm. they were protesting and they recently got a new president so we'll see We'll see what happens. Everybody's got their problems nowadays, yeah. huh? Jeez. Because it was really worse true. with the previous guy. The previous guy was like a billionaire oligarch who was named in like the Pandora Papers and the Panama Papers. I think he was in both of them. I don't remember, but yeah. God, these billionaire oligarchs just making moves across the globe. Yeah. Take a seat, guys. But here's, <laughs> here's, here's a little like just a general piece of advice for you or for anyone watching this. If you currently, at the time of me posting this, if you are not seeing a bunch of stories about protests happening all over the world, you're paying attention to the wrong news outlets because the ones that I follow, like they're reporting on it. Like everyone in all the different countries, they're all protesting. So there's news outlets that aren't reporting on the January 6th commission because <laughs> that's all I see <laughs> that dominates the, the Canadian news and all the American news. I mean, wow, it's like the Super Bowl. No, I I'm, think it's I'm right looking now. at like the people in Sri Lanka who stormed the president's palace. That shit was awesome. See, that, that's more interesting. I got that it. That was awesome. It. Yeah, Sri Lanka!
There's videos of them in the pool and playing with all his nice stuff in the mansion. And yeah, he fled. I think he's not president anymore. But yeah. You know what? At least diversify the news too. Yeah. Like, yeah. Change it up. Like, I'm sick of this channel. I'm going to watch some Sri, Sri, Sri Lankan revolution. <laughs> Thank you so much, Peter. It was so nice meeting you. I'm so grateful to you for coming and chatting with me. And, you know, I'm grateful to you and anybody who listen or feels, you know, like minded to the things I do. So, yeah, they're far and few between, but we'll find each other. Thanks yeah. for having me. Thank you. It's really a good time. Here. <laughs>